Our mind is a messy thing. We all want to think clearly and make the right decisions, but the question is, how do we do that? The Art of Thinking Clearly by Rolf Dobelli discusses many biases and fallacies that make us take wrong decisions. And in this book summary, I'll share five best lessons that will help you become a better thinker. Alrighty, so without further ado, let's dive right in. Lesson 1. Right results doesn't mean right action. Often we think that if the result is right, then the action taken was also right. Well, this might be true in an ideal world, but in reality, there are many factors that contribute to the right result. In fact, we might not even know properly if the result we got is actually right for us or not in the long term. Anyway, let's talk about how results don't justify the action taken. The author gives a beautiful example to explain this idea. If many monkeys choose shares in the share market, some of them will fall and some of them will rise in value. But still a monkey is a monkey, right? A monkey, no matter what share he picks, will still remain a monkey. So if you take any action and you get the right result, don't assume that you got the right outcome because of the right action. Of course, it's possible that you might have taken the right action, but just because the result is as expected, you shouldn't ignore the other factors. People often miss looking at subtle factors. When you don't see the full picture, you give room to many biases. Let's say you are about to be interviewed. Now, let's say that you had four interviews and got chosen in two of them when you wore a particular shirt. Here, your shirt doesn't matter. You'll get picked or rejected regardless. But since you're only looking at the outcome, you may think that your shirt is lucky for you. You may even consider that shirt to be your lucky charm. The harsh reality is, if you're not deserving enough for a particular position, you are likely to be rejected. There might be other factors too. Perhaps the interviewer had a wrong impression of you, or you made a mistake, which doesn't happen often. Things usually go wrong when we don't expect them to. That's life for you. People confuse correlation with causation. If two things happen at the same time, it doesn't mean that one thing caused the other. You are more likely to make mistakes when you are biased. So what's the solution? Consider the randomness of the event, try to understand all the possible factors that could influence it and see how they affect each other. Lesson number two, most of our assumptions are often wrong, even when we feel they're right. We all are prone to confirmation bias. We don't like it when our ideas or beliefs are questioned or found to be wrong. Therefore, we look for pieces of evidence that support them. The problem is, doing so takes us away from reality. It's crucial to make decisions based on reality, not influenced by our ideas or beliefs. So when you learn something new, don't ignore the ideas that go against it. For example, if you like a product on Amazon and desperately want it, you might focus more on the positive reviews while ignoring the negative ones. The correct approach would be to read both positive and negative reviews. But confirmation bias doesn't restrict itself to purchasing the products on Amazon. Sometimes this bias creates bigger problems. It also changes our political and social views. If you appreciate a party or a leader, you are likely to focus on the positive opinions rather than the negative ones. The author suggests that the best way to deal with this bias is to keep a diary where you record all your ideas, assumptions and opinions, and then focus on disproving them. If you find lots of disconfirming pieces of evidence, your idea might be wrong. But if you don't find any, it still doesn't guarantee that your idea is right. Be skeptical about your own beliefs. Most people fiercely hold on to their ideas and opinions. Guess what they do when someone tells them they're wrong? They get angry. What does a wise person do? He takes greater interest in ideas that prove him wrong. Ultimately, the goal is to discover truth, to stick to the facts, not to the opinions. It's a bad idea to rely on assumptions. Lesson 3. More information isn't always better. We are primarily curious creatures. We love to hunt for answers we don't have. Wonderful, isn't it? But the author says that more information isn't necessarily useful. More information means more data. The more the data, the better we will be able to understand, right? Well, not really. That may be true for computers with high processing power, but we are not computers. Despite having many similarities, the problem is, when we load ourselves with too much information, a lot of crap also comes with that. We don't realize what information is good for our minds unless we load it into our minds. Don't confuse this loading with the one we do with computers. We are even more sophisticated than computers. You don't even need to lift your finger to fill your head with information. Information is everywhere if you pay attention. It's good to have information, but only when you really need it. Otherwise, you would end up wasting your mental energy on useless data and may avoid taking any action. If the information isn't helping in the end, then what's the point of having it in the first place? 
Even computers start lagging when you install unnecessary applications as they consume resources in the background. Sometimes you need emptiness within your mind, a free space to decide what's worth loading in. These days, we all have mobiles, so information is being loaded into your mind even when you don't ask for it. The key here is to regulate the amount of information you take in. Get rid of those sources that are constantly trying to bombard you with information. One beautiful example of useless information is news. Most news you consume every day isn't going to help you in your life. Maybe some of it is worth your time, but 80% of it is just noise to your mind. We hardly ever evaluate how much of that information is worth our precious time. Lesson number four. Most stories don't tell the complete truth, so never trust them blindly. The author talks about story bias in one of the chapters. What is story bias? Well, every story you hear is biased. Yes, there is no such thing as unbiased stories. Whatever you hear comes to your ears in the form of stories. Humans don't talk without stories. Because if you only talk facts, you'll sound boring and nobody would like to listen to you. You will almost sound like a broken radio. The problem is stories delude us. To understand this better, let's understand how stories are formed. You see, life is a series of random events. When we connect them in a particular sequence such that they appeal to our senses and mind, a story is formed. Do you like boring movies? Nobody does. Have you ever thought about why we like watching movies? That's because at the end of every movie, there is an ending that satisfies us. When the movie ends, the tension is released. We feel good. Then we talk about the movie with our friends. All of our gossips are also stories. The author says that stories give us a false sense of understanding. We think that we understand why an event happened because we hear stories about it from other people. We tend to forget the fact that sometimes things happen randomly. But you know, we are primarily curious. So what do we do? We connect the dots and make a story. We love order and chaos. Likewise, we want to make sense of everything. However, just because we love something, it doesn't mean that everything in the world will happen orderly. There is randomness too. That means if someone tells you a story, don't assume that you know or understand everything. Facts get distorted and important details are often missed. So don't just blindly give meaning to everything you hear or see. Do investigation. Don't trust all the news without skepticism. Yes, I agree, we don't have all the time in the world to investigate everything. Finding balance is the key here. Lesson number five, learn to quit when it's time. This might sound pessimistic, but quitting isn't always that bad. Allow me to explain. There is a fallacy known as the sunk cost fallacy. We hate to quit when we've invested so much money and so much time in something, despite the thing having no hope in the future. Another bias related with this is the effort justification bias. We start valuing something more if we have put significant effort into achieving it. It's good to have hope, but you should also know when to quit. Sometimes it's better to quit and move on. You know times change, things happen. Most of the things that used to work in the past don't work anymore. So it's a terrible idea to stick to a process or system just because you have invested a lot of time and energy in it. Yes, it may be hard to quit, but the truth is you should change according to the time and situation. Let me give you an example of how this bias affects your life. First, let's talk about the sunk cost fallacy. Let's say you have started a startup. Now it's been five years and you're still not making any profit from it. So what should you do ideally? Yes, you should quit in that case and think about something else, unless you're certain that it has a future. But it won't be easy. Five years of invested time, energy and money will pull you back and stop you from quitting that business. You are now emotionally attached to it. As a result, you will tend to continue that business. Logically, you should quit, but emotionally you won't be able to, as it will demand tremendous emotional strength. Many factors affect the growth or success of any project though. You may also take inputs from other people if needed. Now it's your turn. What's the one biggest thing you've learned from this video? Leave a comment. And if you're new to this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and press the bell icon so that you never miss any updates. Thanks for watching.